Hey guys, it's Chase with csjoseph.life doing another episode for season 27. This is episode three, also known as Eight Rules for Love. And tonight we're going to be discussing the eight rules for loving ENTJs. So uh, eight rules, uh, kind of pretty easy to figure out what the eight rules are for. And uh, since people have different ways of uh, viewing cognitive functions or different ways um, to interpret, you know, people's behaviors within their functional stack. It is necessary to take each of the functional stacks and then actually, you know, provide some semblance of practical application. And practical application is like the whole point behind what we're even doing here. Excuse the uh, lack of light. Uh, if the uh, flashlight runs out of batteries, it is what it is. Then you guys get to enjoy a very nice amount of black as I'm taking my night walk uh, this evening. Besides, it's like really nice here at night. I didn't exactly know how nice it was until very recently, but it's just been bloody fantastic. So anyway, I'm actually really liking the, uh, the scenery out here. Uh, having kind of around some wetland and whatnot. But anyway, um, Eight rules for loving ENTJs. So ENTJs are kind of a very rare breed. They're one of the uh, psychological minorities out there, uh, especially among women. Uh, women, uh, ENTJ women are extremely rare. Uh, they're like less than 1% of the population. Uh, very, very rare uh, to find. ENTJ men are also pretty rare, but ENTJ men have a habit of marrying SFJ women consistently, whereas when it comes to, uh, uh, you know, ENTJ women, that's not necessarily the case. I've actually noticed, especially with the coaching practice, a lot of ENTJ women marrying ISFPs, which is kind of interesting because that's like their polar opposite type. And when it comes to relationships, especially uh, amongst each of the 16 types, People, especially in their youth, they get married to people who are their polar opposites due to them just being irresponsible, trying to seek out people that are kind of like the ideal form of them. And that's when camaraderie comes into play. And, you know, that's, that's a serious issue that people face and it leads to duality or conflict-based relationships instead of actually having something with total compatibility. However, remember the whole reason that we're doing this series of season 27, the reason why, and it's people are like, well, why did you jump all the way ahead to season 27? Well, I did it because people were really requesting this stuff and you know, I figured, you know what? I'm gonna make it available for the audience. But season 27 effectively uh, represents the, well, if I'm not in a compatible relationship with an ENTJ, for example, if I follow these eight rules, I will be successful in my relationship. And honestly, I think that's a very appropriate, a uh, very appropriate thing. And uh, because here's the bottom line, folks: if you're in a relationship with someone, or if you're married to someone, you can at least figure out how viable that relationship is just by following these eight rules. And if you follow these eight rules and you follow them perfectly, naturally your partner or your lover, your spouse will actually start, you know, seeking to have a good relationship with you in kind. However, if they don't, or if following the rules yields absolutely zero fruit, you know immediately that probably it should be recommended that you get a divorce and move on, right? That's what I would recommend. Oh, sorry, I messed with the microphone here. So anyway, just understand that it's our responsibility as human beings to understand each other. Remember, love your neighbor as yourself, and through loving your neighbor as yourself, what business do you have loving anyone if you can't love yourself first? That's why, you know, when it comes to these eight rules for loving, it's not necessarily about the particular type in question. You should also watch the eight rules for loving for your own type. And then as a result of understanding what your own type is, basically, as a result, 
and what are the rules that would need to be followed for loving yourself, maybe if you apply those rules to yourself, you might be successful in loving yourself. If you want to find out more as to how that works, watch the four pillars of self-intimacy. That's the season six playlist here on this YouTube channel uh, or uh, season six on the podcast, csjoseph.life forward slash podcast. If you guys don't actually, you know, want to uh, watch on YouTube, you can listen while you're commuting, uh, downloading podcasts and not using up all of this, uh, you know, um, gosh, what do you call it? Um, you know, you're not using up your data plan, basically. And, and that's, and that's, I think that's, I think that's very valuable. I think that's very necessary uh, for a lot of people, you know, to save on their data plan. Wow, this is a really nice place. So anyway, moving on. But yeah, eight rules for loving. So just a couple of things about ENTJs. Remember their communication style, their structure type, so their direct initiating control. If you want to understand what that means, watch season two and season 15 uh, as it helps you understand the type grid. Also that they are NTs, they're, um, they're pragmatic, they're abstract, uh, and they're systematic, focused on doing the best way of doing things. Uh, because they're control-based, they're focused on outcomes not about the process, they're all about outcomes. That's why they're not gonna make a decision unless they know for a fact they're going to get the outcome that they want. And it's all about what they want because they're ENTJs. So understand that, you know, that's their communication style, their disposition as an intellectual, as an NT, you know, it comes from that pragmatism. They're willing to break the rules if for that getting that better result. They're people that are more likely to, you know, ask uh, forgiveness instead of permission because they're very pragmatic, etc. And you know, all those things are, are very important, of course. So with that being said, yeah, I almost just like ran into a tree. It's kind of interesting doing some night filming, but you know, why not do some experimentation? It's what YouTube is all about, right? Experimentation, right? You know, it's not like I'm trying to like make my own version of the Blair Witch Project, let's be straight. So, but anyway, ENTJs. So ENTJs, they have a lot of struggles with relationships, a lot of struggles, especially since, you know, when they, when it comes to their virtue and vice and watch, uh, I think it's season seven to understand virtue and vice of each of the types, the virtue and the vice of the ENTJ is altruism or generosity versus greed. And ENTJs are some of the most greedy of all of the types. Let's be, let's be straight. But they're also the most generous. They're most altruistic. I'd say like, you know, um, most ENTJs, they're Randian objectivist. Whether or not they actually identify with that belief system or not, the ENTJ archetype exists as the Randian objectivist. And when you're trying to like, you know, have eight rules for loving ENTJs, it's like, okay, well, what exactly, what it, how does one actually love a Randian objectivist, right? Well, it's actually very, very simple. Uh, it's very easy, but you know, uh, Randy and objectivists, they're, they're ultimately libertarian. They're people who wanna have full freedom of choice. They wanna be able to earn their way. They expect others to earn their way as well. They wanna have the opportunity to be able to earn and do it with a sense of freedom. They also want to be able to you know, become these people who, um, who are very giving. See, let, now hold on, this is where people are like, okay, well wait, when you know, well, I'm an ENFP and you say my virtue and vice is, is charity, you know, versus depravity. So what's the difference? So charity, charity is like generosity. It's like it, it's not the same. What's the difference? The prime difference between generosity and charity is that generosity means you're very giving to one person at a time and you give a lot. That's generosity, right? That's altruism and you give a lot. That's like, dropping $5 million, boom, on just like one person or one thing, right? You don't do it very often. That's the ENTJ way. But the ENFP way, the ENFP way of charity, well, that's a little bit different. The ENFP way is over time, because naturally, you know, path of least resistance for ENFPs is that they can become so depraved and so selfish that they end up having a reputation they have a reputation of being um, depraved. They, they have this crazy reputation of being depraved. And, you know, that sucks. That sucks a lot. 
This is why when they're being charitable, charity means you're giving to somebody, it's a small amount, but high frequency. It's happening a lot and to a lot of people, which means word gets out that, oh, this ENFP is charitable. And then that, you know, takes away that reputation of depravity. That's the difference. It's about reputation. It's about TE child reputation. Whereas from an ENTJ standpoint, their generosity or their altruism is actually not about their reputation as much as it is them, their SE child, giving someone the ultimate experience. That's what it's really about, right? So when you're looking at the eight rules for loving ENTJs, you got to keep in mind their, their, their virtue and their vice because the more you exercise the eight rules for love when it comes to ENTJs, the ENTJ will more likely get closer to their virtue and not their vice. This is one of the results or the reasons why you would want to exercise the eight rules for loving any of the 16 types. But when it comes to ENTJs, it keeps them generous. It keeps them altruistic. If you're an ENTJ and you're watching this, exercise the eight rules for love for yourself so you can learn some additional techniques on loving yourself outside of, you know, taking responsibility for meeting your own needs, having personal standards, obviously, uh, then also having uh, personal boundaries and enforce them and then knowing what your personal goals are. And then those four combined, then you can have a roof over your head of self-respect, right? That's season six content in a nutshell. So in order for you to reach those areas, you become, well, well, the result of, as a result of reaching those areas, you become altruistic, right? So, but the thing is, is like, what if you're in a relationship with an ENTJ and they're very viceful? What happens if you're in a relationship and they're very greedy? They're greedy with their time or they're workaholics, right? Or they won't let you spend money or they're being too controlling, etc. right? What if a lot of these bad behaviors is not necessarily their fault, but it's actually your fault? What if? What if it's your fault? What if you are the reason uh, because you're not taking care of your half of the relationship with your ENTJ that they feel unloved, that they feel disrespected. Remember, relationships are all about love and respect, right? And what is the source of what makes a, what makes what makes someone lovable? It's beauty. Beauty makes somebody lovable, right? Well, what makes somebody noble, right? Uh, or what what makes someone respectable? It's what it's all about nobility. Nobility. A man's nobility is what makes him respectable. Now, remember, sure, men men want love, but not as much as they want respect. It's not good enough for a woman to say. I love you to a man. It is not good enough. Women have this problem of falling in love with just about any jackass on the street. Men instinctually know this. You guys don't get that? I recommend you guys watch season four playlist on this YouTube channel and I outline exactly why that is the case, right? Why is C.S. Joseph making this claim? Go to season four, right? Season four playlist on this YouTube channel. Watch all six episodes in order. So love and respect, right? Men, you know, but women, women want to be loved, not as much as they want to be respected. And then it's like all these women, especially ENTJ women, because they're very masculine women. They're like, no, we want to be more respected than loved. They say that that's not actually true. That's really not actually true. Because why else do I find ENTJ women, especially in my coaching practice, in abusive relationships, consistently abusive relationships? I, it's like so crazy to me to watch all these ENTJ women with their SC child, giving the men in their life really good experiences, etc. And then all of a sudden, all the sudden, they just allow this constant stage of uh, this constant abuse and this, uh, this state of codependence. It's absolutely asinine to me. It makes absolutely zero sense, right? And I find this, I find this to be absolutely frustrating. So why, why can't, why can't people, um, why can't people get to a point where, where like they understand that, you know, you just, you you know, you, you need, you need love, you know, you need, and it's more than just love. It's more than just respect. It's an equilibrium. It's a yin and yang equilibrium. So when it comes to ENTJs, right, you know, 
it's oftentimes you'd hear the ENTJ women out there because you know a lot of them they're very successful in business or will be successful they're very career minded because TE here is all about achievements Achievement is everything to ENTJs, especially ENTJ women, especially ENTJ men. Achievement is everything. And they need to have the freedom to achieve. Oftentimes they find themselves in these abusive relationships and their spouse or their partner's not even allowing them to achieve because their spouse or their partner's always trying to dominate their attention or take their choice away or they think less of them and less of their capability and then all of a sudden the ENTJ starts believing that this per they're believing this person that is supposedly their lover or their spouse is this person who lacks confidence in them and like oh okay if this person who is my spouse who's so close to me really believes this about me or thinks this about me maybe I'm not as good as I feel I might be and then that just causes the ENTJ to implode on themselves because they're so afraid of being not good enough, not worthy enough that they don't even try. And then all of a sudden they wake up at 40 years old and then they're in the middle of their midlife crisis, right? Because they're believing a lie. Because their lover, their partner, their spouse doesn't actually love them, doesn't actually respect them, right? Well, here you go, ENTJs. Here's the eight rules for loving ENTJs so that you know whether or not you are being respected. So that you know whether or not you are being loved. So that you could take care of yourself better. So you could take responsibility for meeting your own needs and having personal standards. You know the rules that you set up for yourself so you can meet your own needs. Or personal boundaries. You know you, the rules that you set up so other people outside of you. This includes your children, by the way. This includes your children so that other people do not inhibit you from meeting your own needs. Right? What about that? Oh, and then obviously, after you have all that figured out, then you have personal goals. Nice, right? So, eight rules. Here are the eight rules. Rule number one. Here it goes, rule number one. And we're already at 17 minutes in. Rule number one. Rule number one is this. Always be brutally honest with your ENTJ, even if it hurts. Even if you know it's going to hurt them. Be brutally honest. Always tell the truth. Always tell them exactly what's on your mind and always exactly what you're thinking. Have you guys ever read the book Attached where he talks about avoidant attachment style, right? Avoidant attachment style where you keep everything bottled up inside and you don't actually talk about your problems or your feelings or your issues, especially with your spouse or your lover. You know, I was with Railgun earlier today and she started talking about how it's really lame that, you know, people out there have conversations about the problems in their relationships with other people instead of actually their spouses, their lovers, etc., their partners. They actually are willing to have conversations with people that aren't actually the person that it's involved with. And it's like, okay, wait a minute. Those people, those people are the people who have avoidant attachment style. Those people are avoidant, right? That's a problem. So being avoidant, that's not cool. Being avoidant, there's no, there's no excuse for that. Okay? So read the book Attached, ENTJs, or people who love ENTJs. Read the book Attached. It's funny. What type out of all the 16 types is the most likely to have avoidant attachment style? Oh, wait a minute. That's the golden pair with the ENTJ, the INTP. That's right. So INTPs, if you're watching this, it is your duty and your responsibility to read that book and make sure that you gain secure attachment style instead of avoidant attachment style because you're just going to cause pain to your ENTJ. And then I would be the guy to recommend to your ENTJ that they make you feel unwanted, that they don't value you, and that they would ultimately leave you and want somebody else. I would tell them that to their face. And I wouldn't feel bad about it. I wouldn't feel guilty about it. I would be egging them on and cheering them as they dumped you in the dumpster where you belong because of your inability to come to terms with the fact that maybe you should be secure in yourself and be willing to express or criticize or tell your ENTJ the hard truth regardless of how it makes them feel. If you are too guilty to tell your ENTJ the truth or too guilty to be honest with them, what the hell? Why are you in a relationship with them to begin with? This doesn't even make sense to me. Why? I thought you're TI hero. Why are you allowing 
feelings, my feelings, to get in the way of TI Hero Truth. What are you guys doing? You're supposed to be the most brilliant of all the types other than INFPs. Where's that TI Hero Truth? Bring it out. Show me. That's all the ENTJ ever wants is brutal honesty. Someone who's just going to be straight up honest with them. To the point where like, you know, you're like, oh, you know, does this, does this make me look fat? And, you know, TI Hero's like, yep. Yes, it does. And then they get all butt hurt, SC child butt hurt about it. But then at least you're honest with them. Because the thing is, if you're not honest with them, they're going to lose trust in you. But at least you're willing to criticize them because now your ENTJ has the opportunity to improve themselves, right? And then you, INTP, are not butt hurt about the fact that your ENTJ is dressing ugly or letting their body go or being irresponsible. How are they going to change? Oh, but then maybe you have nice guy syndrome. Let's see, another book you need to read is No More Mr. Nice Guy. Maybe you're being too nice. See, if you're just telling the truth to your ENTJ, there's no risk of you having nice guy syndrome or you being too nice. You have to be willing to tell the truth, the harsh, unadulterated, unabridged truth. That is rule number one. Tell the harsh truth, even if it risks hurting your ENTJ's feelings, because that's what they need the most. And the reason why they're in a relationship with you to begin with is because you probably used to tell them the truth all the time. But instead, you got afraid, afraid that they wouldn't value you anymore or afraid that they wouldn't, you know, be willing to have a relationship with you anymore because what? Oh, I was too critical. Wow. Maybe you shouldn't be in a relationship with somebody that can't take the heat of truth. Maybe that would be the more responsible decision right so rule number two always give your ENTJ a choice they're all about their future they're all about um, you know sometimes they're very impulsive sometimes though you got to be willing to warn them that what they want to do is irresponsible you want to keep them responsible right responsibility is everything Keep them responsible. And, you know, ENTJs in their youth, they're very irresponsible with what they want. You know, they're, um, it's like, hey, you know, I'm a serial monogamous. I'll just, you know, have sex with whoever. It don't matter, you know. They get very irresponsible. They become that party animal, all about giving everyone that really good experience, all about having the center of attention, all about having the reputation of putting on the biggest parties and the biggest everythings, right? Driving the biggest vehicles, wearing the coolest clothes, going to the biggest clubs, big, 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 go big or go home type of attitude, these ENTJs. Well, it's pretty impulsive. So impulsive sometimes that like, you know, when they're in a relationship with somebody for seven years and that person's been loyal to them for seven years, then all of a sudden, you know, they end up going after someone who's in a relationship with somebody else that's half their age, for example. What happens then, right? Oh, but that ENTJ is being impulsive. So you have to be willing to hold your ENTJ accountable. Give them choices, but make sure that they are wise choices. Make sure that that is the responsible choice. So when they tell you, oh, I want this, you'd be like, okay, yeah, sure. But is that the wise choice? Question them. Is it the wise choice? Is this the responsible choice for you? So what you offer the ENTJ is options. You offer the ENTJ options. Options that, yeah, maybe if you want to do Xanatos Gambit, they all benefit you in the end. But really, think about it this way. All you have to do is tell the ENTJ what you think is the best choice and why. Because if you don't, they're going to find themselves in a situation where they get impulsive and they're going to want the wrong thing. And they are at risk of being irresponsible with what they want, which then will (laughs) turn into... You and them having a bad experience together as a result. So, present the ENTJ with wise choices, with responsible choices, right? Not just any choice, but choices that ultimately are not impulsive and are planned and calculated and precise, right? Precision of choice. Provide them with precise, wise, well-thought-out decisions, so that they are making the best choice. So that's rule number two, provide ENTJs with the best choice, right? 
Rule number three, always react positively to everything that they show you. They are going out of their way to make a cake or make a meal or, hey, I, I bought these clothes today or, hey, how do you think this looks, right? Always ask you all the time. So be honest with them and share with them how you react to that. Don't be those lazy INPs out there or even those lazy ENPs out there who just choose not to react out of just pure laziness. That's annoying. It's especially annoying to ENTJs because it's like, I give you feedback all the time. I always tell you how I feel all the time. But the least you could do for me is taste this and tell me if this meal tastes good to you. At least the least you could do for me is try out my new barbecue recipe and tell me if it's any good. The least you could do is tell me what you want me, what you would prefer me to wear, what kind of clothes I should buy. What, what clothes do I want to buy, actually? Because you're like, oh, I like that. Constantly tell your ENTJ what gives you a good experience, what makes you comfortable. If you don't share that information with them and then call them out later for making you uncomfortable, that makes you a hypocrite. That makes you a hypocrite. And that is not love towards an ENTJ. That's actually insanely disrespectful and unloving. You need to tell them what gives you a good experience because that's why they're in a relationship with you. They want to give you the best possible experience ever. It's their inner child for crying out loud. They just want to give you a good experience. They just want you to be comfortable. They want you to have the best possible sexual experience ever that, they can, that you can only get it from them because they want to be that high achiever, right? That's all that SE child is all about, that high achiever. And then they want to be able to receive credit for their achievements from you. So you give them credit by saying, wow, that was a really good experience. You give them, wow, that was great. That was a good bedroom experience. You know what I'm saying? Well, that was a really good meal that you made. Or wow, you drove that car really well. You have to constantly say, hey, this was a good experience. Here's another example. Demonstrations of loyalty, super important. Share with them, share everything with them. Give them photos of what you're doing throughout the day so that they don't feel like that you've been, that, you know, they're, they're lost, that there's still actually a relationship with them. Because if you're not doing that, you know, they're so forgetful that they need you to remember everything or at least demonstrate that you care by be like, hey, you know, I'm gonna send you a photo of what I'm doing right now, right? Also, ENTJs are big, super big on sexting. Why are you not sexting with your ENTJ lover? I highly recommend it. Although I prefer that if you're gonna be sending naked photos of each other, be married first. Like that's like the wise decision. So be married. But yeah, ultimately understand, you know, demonstrations of loyalty, uh, as well as saying, you know, responding in kind to the, uh, the kind of um, attention that uh, they give you, give them your attention. That is rule number three. Give them positive affirmation in terms of attention, right? Rule number four, ENTJs are so afraid of being bad people. They're so afraid of being bad wives or bad husbands or not good enough or not worthy enough that they will go out of their way to do the good thing all the time. Sometimes in their quest to do the good thing, they don't actually do a good thing. They think they're doing a good thing, but they don't. So what you need to tell them is by following rule number one and being 100% honest with them, when they actually do do the good thing, you tell them to their face, I think highly of you. Makes them feel good. It makes them feel on cloud nine. Wow, I'm a really good person. Also, you could tell them, hey, if you do this, then that means you're a good person. Wait a minute, that could be used for manipulation. Be real careful when you use that. Be real, don't be like manipulative or at least uh, um, malicious. Don't be maliciously manipulative. Be positively manipulative, right? Make them feel good. Always make your ENTJ feel better about themselves. It takes the fear away. So when you tell them, hey, I'm having a really good experience, or hey, I really think highly of you, or hey, no one makes me more comfortable than you in the whole world, or hey, that was the best sex I've ever had in my life, or hey, 
and you say all these things and you're basically reacting to them especially in the bedroom they want to be able to touch you and you react to them instantly touch per touch they want that immediate physical sensual feedback from you are you willing to go that far because if you're not giving them that response or that feedback they think that they're not doing a good job and then they freak out and then there is no sexual compatibility in the relationship you know and then it's like the painter trying to paint the painter you both are aiming your paintbrushes at each other and getting everything real dirty, whereas one person's got to be the canvas. If you're in a relationship with an ENTJ, it's your job to be the canvas. That means you might be at risk in the bedroom situation of just laying there. Because guess what? ENTJs want you to be their canvas, so be the canvas. It's okay. Luckily for them, INPs and ENPs, they're pretty cool with being canvases, especially INPs. Some INPs have described sexual experiences with me where all they did was just lay there. Because that SE child takes that painting experience very seriously. So rule number five, rule number five. ENTJs are always so worried about what they think and they're so worried that they're wrong that they will go to multiple sources multiple reference points with their TE hero to find what the truth is. They're always on this quest to find higher truth, right? And in part of following rule number one through cognitive access, yes, by being harsh and true to them, that's very useful. But every now and then, in order to make sure that you're telling the truth, it is your job to make sure that you're doing proper research yourself. The more research you do, that the more input you give yourself makes your TI, your intelligence, your ability to wield true false itself in a more efficient manner, such that you could go to the ENTJ and be like, hey, you might want to think about this and actually bring the ENTJ reference points sometimes and to get them thinking about things because it takes all of their worry away because they're worried they're not actually that smart. And then remind them of their achievements. Would somebody who's stupid not be or unintelligent not be able to accomplish all these things? Would someone who is who is stupid not be as artistic as you are, right? Because remember, you know, you in the relationship, you are basically an art project to an ENTJ. They need the freedom to create. They need the ability to make you into this person who is absolutely everything that they're looking for. So, so keep that in mind. Um, it, it's really, it's really important that you know you are always making sure that you're armed with the proper research or the reference points in case for some reason you're they are not able to solve their own problem, so that they look to you to solve that problem. Or if you don't know the answer, you have to be willing to find the answer or help them find the answer. It takes their worry away. Because sometimes ENTJs worry about, well, if I'm in this situation and I got to react in the moment, I might not have all the facts. And this is especially important in ENTJs' careers. I know that we've been talking about sex a lot so far in this lecture, but let's talk about their careers. Like when they're in their careers, they need to be in the know. They need to have all of the information for proper decision making. And ENTJ is all about, they're, they're, they are decision makers. They are executors. They can't decision make properly. They can't execute properly unless they have all the information. If you are withholding information from your ENTJ, you are being unloving. So that's rule five. Do not withhold information. Always provide information and references. Even if you do not know the answer, go find it and bring it to them so that they can stop worrying. Because once the worry is out of the way, then they will do a great job, an amazing job at that meeting, at that seminar, at that business, at that job interview. They will kill it because you help them get all of the information that they needed to be effective. Rule number six, always tell your ENTJ what you're going to do before you do it. Naturally, they get so critical towards other people's intentions that sometimes they get the idea, the wrong idea, the wrong impression, that you're about to cheat on them. I have known some ENTJs who cheat on their partner, spouse, lover, because they jump to a conclusion and assume that the other person has cheated on them. 
It's actually a problem that all NJs have, but ENTJs specifically think that's a problem. ENTJs need to realize that just because their opinion of a person can change on a whim doesn't necessarily mean that their lover or their partner or their spouse's high opinion of them changes on a whim. So you have to remind them of that all the time. You have to be like, listen, I have a very high opinion of you and it's not going to change. It's also like a demonstration of loyalty for their SE child for following rule number three, right? It's super important. They will always be critical of everyone's intentions because the ENTJ automatically assumes, regardless of their experiences in their life, regardless of the abuses in their life, they could have never had a bad experience. They could have never had a bad betrayal in their life. They could have never been screwed over in their whole life, but they will still potentially treat you as if you will betray them, as if you are a traitor. If they start treating you like a trailer, traitor, stop being avoidant and then just be like, well, if I'm going to do the time, I may as well do the crime. How about you get in the ENTJ's face and you criticize them and grind them into dust with your harsh truth, you know, following rule number one, so that you're like, see, I'm not betraying you. And then they'll feel bad about themselves. And then they'll want to fix the problem because they feel bad. And he's like, oh, okay, yeah, that's not true. I was jumping to the wrong conclusion. And I was judging you for something you didn't even do. So how do you solve that problem? Ultimately, tell the ENTJ what you're going to do or where you're going to be before you are there. The ENTJs are all about plans. They're all about outcomes. It's like, okay, well, what's your outcome? Where are you going to be? What's your, uh, you know, uh, why, why are you going to this grocery store at this time or whatever? They just want to know. They just want to be included, right? They want to know what's in your head. Tell them your thoughts and tell them, hey, you know, what you're going to do or where you're going to be ahead of time. Just share that with them. Create a plan, a mutual plan that both of you have and agree to it. That way, the ENTJ feels safe. Otherwise, they're not going to feel safe. Otherwise, they're going to think that their relationship is out of control or they're going to feel that you don't trust them because you're not willing to share what you're doing. Now, granted, you may uh, be trying to surprise your ENTJ with something and that happens, so you either gotta be extra sneaky or you just gotta tell them, no, I can't tell you, it's for a surprise. That's fine. ENTJs like surprises. Of course, most SA users like surprises, right? Well, that's how that works. Rule number seven. Make sure that you help your ENTJ remember things. They need memory tools. Memory tools like Evernote or MindNote, mind mapping software or note taking software. All of these things, right? Very necessary to an ENTJ because they'll forget. Hold your ENTJ account accountable. Tell them to their face. Exercising rule number one. Hey, I don't think it's a good idea for you not to be taking notes. Why? Where's your notepad? Why did you forget your notepad? Why aren't you taking notes on your phone? Why aren't you transposing those notes to your centralized note repository like on Evernote? Because if ENTJs don't store their memories in the physical environment somehow or store them outside of themselves, they will forget. They need totems. Take photos. It's absolutely critical that you take photos so that you have totems, photos, reminders. That's what a totem is. It's a reminder. Reminder of past shared experiences. Because the thing is, is that if you really are an ENTJ's lover, if you really are in a relationship with an ENTJ, the moment you die, half of them dies with them, with you. They lose all their memories because you yourself are a walking reminder of your relationship. You yourself is what half of their entire identity is tacked onto. They've built their entire identity around you because they have SI trickster. So if you die, all their memories die with you. This is why it's especially important to make sure you are chronicling your relationship with ENTJ and you are demanding and expecting your ENTJ to chronicle as well. It is absolutely critical. So make sure, rule number seven, make sure my ENTJ is chronicling. And then rule number eight. This is one thing that 
really bothers me about people. You know, ever want to know where resting bitch face comes from? See, ENTJs, especially ENTJ women, get constantly demonized or derided by other people, especially other women, for having resting bitch face or being too emasculating, right? And it's because women, by and large, are expected to have really high feelings and feel good and, you know, make decisions based on emotions, whereas ENTJ women make decisions based on numbers and rationale. So why, why do you expect them to behave in a way that they are not? Stop doing that. Recognize that ENTJs don't give a damn how anyone feels. They don't care how you feel. They care about how they feel, but hopefully you're an INTP and you don't have to care about how you feel either because you don't. So it makes the relationship great because you don't care about how they feel. They don't care about how you feel. So no problem, no issue, right? Do not hold an ENTJ to the standard of trying to be empathic of, oh, you need to feel other people's feelings. Well, how would that make, you know, sympathy is like when someone says, well, how would that make you feel, right? When you feel something because you're augmenting the experience that someone has. That's what makes ENTJ so sympathetic and ultimately so um, generous and so altruistic through that sympathy. But empathy is actually being aware of how somebody else feels, right? Don't expect and the ENTJ to be aware of how anyone feels except themselves. It's not their job. Stop it. If you do that and you tell the ENTJ that they're a bad person because obviously they don't care. Oh, wow. They're like, okay, yeah. You really think I don't care? Yeah, I really don't care. Let me show you. Let me prove to you how much I really don't care. You know? And then it's very manipulative part of them comes out and they're just like, oh, hey, you know, oh, I'm going to love you. I'm going to take care of you, right? Except you'll be in a prison for the rest of eternity. Or I'm going to cook this meal for you and there'll be laced parasites and you're going to die a horrible, painful, slow death. But, you know, I just caring about you, right? I, see, I'll, I'll show you how caring I really am. I'll show you, right? That's F.E. Demon, right? Maybe you shouldn't allow F.E. Demon by coming out by not expecting them to have this ethical code of behavior. He, ENTJs are naturally inclined to treating people like numbers and treating people like cattle. You have to remind them that they need to be human, obviously, and criticize them appropriately so that they are not treating people like cattle. It's very important. But at the same time, it is not their job to care about other people and care for other people because they've made it their job to care for themselves. I have had to care for myself, and I've expected nobody else to care for me, so why do I have to care about anyone else when no one cared about me to begin with? That's their whole point of view. And that point of view needs to be respected. If you do not respect it, their demon will come out, and that's because you are being unloving towards your ENTJ. So what is the rule? The rule is don't expect them to be aware of how anyone feels. Do not force them to be aware of how anyone feels. It's not their job. It is their job to be aware of how they feel, and it is your job to make them feel better, to make them feel good about themselves. It is absolutely critical that you do this. So let's, let's sum up what we've learned today. So ENTJs, rule one, be brutally honest. Always share your brutal, honest thoughts with your ENTJ, even if it hurts their feelings. It's the only thing that they have to grow. It is the standard with which they live by, and often ENTJs, as their lover, spouse, uh, partner, they hang off of every word. So why would you hide the truth from them? Why would you try hide your true thoughts from them? That's dumb. In fact, it's stupid. Don't do it. I thought you were supposed to be smart if you're in a relationship with an ENTJ, right? What are you doing? You know, in rule, rule two, always help them make the best choice. The best choice is absolutely critical. There are a lot of choices out there, but they need help making the best one. They need help making the right one. 
It's not like an ESFP or an ESTP where you just let them have a choice and any choice is a good choice. No, no, no. With an ENTJ, that choice needs to be the responsible choice. Help them make the best choice. Help them make the most responsible choice. And then rule three, like I said, um, always react positively to anything that they show you. Demonstrate loyalty to them, steadfastness, perseverance, persevere for them, always be there for them. Be willing to drop everything at a hat for them if they need to. And always give them good feedback or negative feedback as needed based on how they look or the meals that they cook or how they sound or anything visual, audio, or sensory so that they can adjust it to give you a better experience because that's all they want to do, right? Let them be on top in the bedroom. That's another good way of putting it. Rule four, always make them be a better person. Remind them that they are worthy of you, basically. And then uh, rule five, make sure that you help them find answers that they don't know the answers to to destroy that worry that they have. And so that you take that worry away by giving them reference points and information. Rule six, always tell your ENTJ what you're going to do before you do it. Tell them your intentions so that they are not critical of your intentions. They do not assume that you are going to betray them. Rule seven, help them remember everything. Help them create totems and reminders so that they can remember who they are because you yourself will be a totem. And when you're gone, they won't be able to remember anymore. Teach them. They'll be more effective in their careers as well as their relationship with you if they remember things, and they can as long as they chronicle. So help your ENTJ chronicle. And rule number eight, which is what we just talked about, do not expect them to care about what other people feel like. That's your job, technically, in the relationship. It is not their job. Their job, they've had to take care of themselves this whole time. It is not their responsibility to take care of somebody else, at least somebody else's feelings, that is, right? It's not their job to take care of someone else's feelings. In the relationship, that would technically be your job because hopefully you're an NTP, right? So anyway, folks, that is the eight rules for loving ENTJs. If you found this lecture useful, helpful, educational, enlightening, please subscribe to us here on uh, YouTube, uh, also on the podcast. Leave a, a like while you're at it and a comment below. That would be great. I read all of the comments, uh, lots of comments to uh, read these days. Haven't been around very much. We're still working on that quiz. It's coming out, guys, where people will be able to uh, type themselves uh, on our website. It is coming, and uh, we'll get that result out to everybody. But uh, it's been a... Uh, it's been a long way going, and uh, I'd also like to thank the ENTJs and their altruism and their generosity towards me and this community, especially some of those of you who are financially uh, um, um, uh, providing for, uh, for us to keep the lights on, even though the lights are technically off right now because it's dark out, right? So, but uh, every little bit counts, even if it's just $5 a month on the Patreon, and that's patreon.com forward slash csjoseph. Otherwise, folks... Just remember, it's your responsibility to follow the eight rules for love and ENTJs. Just keep sharing your thoughts. Give them choices. Help them reach the best choice. Uh, respond positively to any experience that they give you or negatively so that you can help them give you an even better experience. Don't hide from them. Don't hide anything. Share everything with them. Help them become better people. Make them feel good about themselves. Uh, help them make better decisions by giving them proper reference points. If you don't know the answer, go find it for them or help or go on it on a journey with them to find it. Tell them what your intentions are. Help them remember things by remembering for them. And also don't expect them to care for other people's feelings because that's not fair to them. So if you follow these rules, that's you loving an ENTJ in the way that they need to be loved. And hopefully they will respond in kind. So with all that being said, folks, this is C.S. Joseph signing off. I'll see you guys later tonight.